Good afternoon. Welcome. I am Digby Ritchie and we continue our studies of Shakespeare, brushing up the bard. This is the final lecture, the third lecture, in a series devoted to Shakespeare's great text, The Tempest. In my previous lecture, I focused on the way Prospero uses his magical powers to arrange a successful union between Ferdinand and Miranda. It is important to note that Prospero's progress towards self-discovery is also a progress towards re-establishing harmony and happiness, both for him as a father and ultimately as a ruler. But the process is a very complex and painful process. For South African readers and viewers of The Tempest particularly, there will inevitably be a sense of a movement towards truth and reconciliation in this remarkable text. For Prospero to move from a desire for vengeance to true forgiveness of his betrayers and enemies, a lengthy and soul-searching process has to take place. But the truth has to be established, and those who are guilty of evil have to be compelled to acknowledge it. Their evil must be exposed. And Prospero uses his arts to expose the evil first. Now it's important here to consider the fact that Prospero is the wise philosopher magician figure on the island. But in a sense, and I've quoted Samuel Taylor Coleridge already, he is the playwright figure too, the director figure on the island. Coleridge spoke of Prospero as the very Shakespeare of the island. And the devices that are used in The Tempest would, in a theatrical production, be enormously effective because there's a kind of meta-theatrical quality about them. Our attention as viewers is being directed to the magic of the theatre, what we call these days special effects. So it is important to look a little at the whole idea of the mask, M-A-S-Q-U-E. Masks were elaborate productions performed by aristocrats, even members of royal families, and some professional actors at court. They were particularly popular at the court of King James I, the successor of Elizabeth I, James came to the throne in 1603. And elaborate stage machinery and effects were used to make masks as magical as possible. On his island, Prospero, if you like, is the master of the mask. He stages the extraordinary classical mask with the goddesses to emphasize the fact that marriage must be a harmonious blend of the spirit and the flesh. But he also stages a terrifying mask to reveal to his enemies the extent of their sin in the past. In Act 3, Scene 3, with thunder and lightning, Ariel enters as a harpy, claps wings and destroys the feast before the shipwrecked royals and their supporters. And he cries out, You are three men of sin that destiny has decided to expose and has used the never surfeited sea in order to do so. Ariel demands that the wrongdoers fully acknowledge their evil from the past. And if they are going to repent, they must show genuine heart's sorrow and they must have a clear life, a virtuous life following. Now this terrifying anti-mask, you could call it, this mask of monsters, because remember a harpy in classical mythology is a really terrifying figure, a repellent hybrid of a woman and a bird of prey, taloned, winged, harpies would descend upon festivity and revelry and foul up feasts, which is exactly what they do here. So Ariel's appearance here is absolutely terrifying. And the effect on one of the wrongdoers, at least, is huge. Alonso is devastated. He cries out, it is monstrous monstrous, and his guilt-stricken mind keeps hearing the name of Prospero, 
and he believes that this is why his son is now dead at the bottom of the sea. We know, of course, that Ferdinand is not dead, but pain and guilt dominate Alonso's mind, and he says, I will seek him, meaning Ferdinand, deeper than ear plummet sounded, and with him lie muddied at the bottom of the sea. Alonso, through guilt and pain, is driven to almost suicidal despair. So the impact of the revelation of the truth is absolutely huge, at least on Alonso. But now where must Prospero go at this point? He now has to make his choices and move towards reconciliation and forgiveness. Because one could argue that with the appearance of the wing-clapping monstrous harpy, the revenge of Prospero has reached its climax. That was in Act 3, Scene 3. But let us leap to Act 5, Scene 1, and focus on the process of forgiveness. Interestingly, and I've made this point in previous lectures, it is Ariel that prods Prospero in the direction of forgiveness. Shakespeare surely suggesting yet again that in order to forgive those who have wronged us, we have to be capable of using our imaginations. We have to be capable of imagining how our enemies feel and be prepared to forgive them. So, to Act 5, Scene 1. Here Prospero exalts that his project gathers to a head. But Ariel speaks to him of how grieved and even maddened his enemies actually are. The king, his brother and yours, abide all three distracted, and the remainder mourning over them, brimful of sorrow and dismay. But chiefly him that you termed, sir, the good old Lord Gonzalo, his tears run down his beard like winter's drops from eaves of reeds. Your charm so strongly works him that if you now beheld him, your affections would become tender. Ariel emphasizes how much suffering Prospero's art has caused here, suffering inflicted also on the virtuous Gonzalo, who weeps over what has happened. The others are distracted. And notice Ariel suggests that it is time for Prospero's affections to become tender. Prospero asks, Dost thou think so, spirit? And Ariel replies, Mine would, sir, were I human. And mine shall, Prospero declares. This is for me one of the most moving sections of the play. Ariel, the tricksy spirit, says to Prospero, it is time you are a human being. Display humanity at its best. Humanity is not simply about the exercise of power. It is also about understanding and compassion. Show it now. And Prospero, who is fully capable of imagining the suffering of his foes, says he shall show compassion. He orders Ariel to release the grieved, even crazed victims of his magic. And then Prospero delivers a magnificent speech, very, very important in the context of the Tempest as a whole. In the speech, he talks about the power of his magic. And it is an absolutely extraordinary speech. He says that he has aroused tempests. He has split oaks. He has even raised up the dead. Now, it is a disturbing speech, too, because it does seem to reveal an element of hubris, as the ancient Greeks called it, H-U-B-R-I-S, God-challenging power and arrogance on Prospero's part. And in fact, this speech and unfortunately I don't have the time to read it to you in full, is certainly inspired by a passage in Ovid's Metamorphoses. And it is a passage in which the sorceress princess Medea exults in her magical powers. 
altering nature, raising up the dead. So what is Shakespeare suggesting here? Is he suggesting that Prospero's powers are evil, linked as they are to that terrifying and blood-soaked figure, Medea? I don't think so. I think that would be taking matters much too far. Rather, Shakespeare is suggesting that there is a potential for evil in any power, and Prospero's powers are indeed great. They can be misused, but they can also be used for the purposes of good, for restoration and harmony, rather than for destruction. And in this speech, Prospero makes the decision to discard his powers. He is going to bury his books, essentially, the very books that gave him these magical powers. He is going to sweep aside secret knowledge and emerge as a ruler, yes, but as a fully human ruler, unassisted by the arts of magic. Prospero insists that he will break his staff and drown his book. Supernatural powers, therefore, will disappear completely. Some commentators on The Tempest make the point that Prospero is discarding his magician status and becoming merely human. I disagree with such statements because I think this amazing play demonstrates that there is nothing mere about being fully human. But I will deal with that point in more detail later in this address. Now, it's important to note that writers of Shakespeare's time, preeminently Shakespeare himself, but also Christopher Marlowe, were obsessed with the idea of the overreacher figure, the aspiring human being, the human being who wishes to use knowledge even to challenge the gods. The archetype of such a figure is, of course, Dr. Faustus in Christopher Marlowe's great play, Dr. Faustus. The tragical history of Dr. Faustus. Faustus is, of course, the supreme aspiring intellectual who sacrifices his soul for what he believes will be divine power and knowledge, only to discover that all knowledge provided by hell is illusory, meretricious. Even his vision of Helen of Troy in the closing scenes of the play is a deceptive one. This is no more than a succubus, an evil spirit who sucks his soul away. In the Elizabethan and the Jacobean age, there were many people who experimented with supposedly forbidden knowledge, experimenting with alchemy and probing what could be regarded as dark forces. However, those who prided themselves on their occult knowledge also believed that such knowledge could always be used for the good. One of the most famous was the Elizabethan occultist John Dee, and that's spelled D-double-E, who lived from 1527 to 1608, and who was a powerful figure in what could be called the Elizabethan secret service. John Dee insisted that speculative intellectuals should use, and I'm quoting here, Good means to mount above the clouds and stars. Good means to mount above the clouds and stars. And that's a very important point to remember. The intellect must be used to elevate humanity. One must aspire. One must strive to rise above the mundane and the commonplace. But that should not cause one to become arrogant and inhuman, and to challenge the deity. Christopher Marlowe's Faustus declares that he, Faustus, will try his brains to gain a deity, and that is the problem. Now, could it be argued that Prospero has tried to use his brains to gain a deity? In a sense, on his island, he has godlike power. So is he a Faustus-like anti-hero? No, for Shakespeare suggests that when Prospero's powers 
are serving his anger and his ego. They have the potential to be destructive. But Prosper is a great intellectual and he is capable of development and change. And he is in the process of changing. So to affix the label of intellectual anti-hero to Prospero, as some commentators do, is mistaken. He is not dedicated to vengeance at the conclusion of the play. His initial commitment to punishment and vengeance has undergone a remarkable sea change, to use that wonderful phrase from the text. Let us glance back at Act 4, Scene 1, and examine one of the most frequently quoted speeches from The Tempest. Prospero says to Ferdinand and Miranda, Our revels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit, shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. These are, of course, magnificent lines, and they emphasize that theatrical art fades, disappears very quickly. There is even an in-joke about the globe, Shakespeare's globe theater and our world. The imagery thus relates to both theater and life. Theatrical spectacle is transient, but so too is life, and it is best that we acknowledge this transience and behave as virtuously and generously as possible during our time on the earth, which is, after all, a short time. It is not simply a beautiful speech, but a profoundly philosophical one. Prospero acknowledging the fact that no matter how powerful one may be on earth, one is not actually a deity and one's life on earth is limited, and one must acknowledge those limitations in order to be fully human. But this wonderful elegiac speech, this discarding of the powers of the mask master and the magus, this speech is interrupted by the beating of his brain because he feels still rage directed at Caliban. Although what we could call the truth and reconciliation process seems to have worked as far as Prospero's former foes and betrayers were concerned, particularly where Alonso is concerned, Prospero still has to come to terms with Caliban, whom he persists in seeing as a monster and a misshapen knave. And he punishes Caliban and Stefano and Trinculo very brutally indeed, in a terrifying anti-mask as well. They are pursued by hounds and tormented by hunting dogs. They are chased across the island. And remember, at this stage, they're already stinking of horse piss. They have been deceived by gaudy clothing upon the line. And then they are attacked by the barking dogs of Prospero's spirits. The punishment does seem to be pretty complete, but Prospero still has to confront Caliban, who has, after all, planned to murder him and establish drunken fools in the place of power on the island. Jungian and Freudian readers of The Tempest are particularly fond of the line I am about to quote. Prospero confronts his relationship with Caliban fully when he states, this thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine. The line is deservedly famous, but what exactly is Prospero saying here? He is surely acknowledging the Caliban within himself. 
the element of the monstrous which is within all of us. He is capable of seeing the fact that he must come to terms with the mixture of good and evil within his own being if he is going to be the wise and just ruler that he has always aspired to be. The repentant Caliban is terrified and thinks he's going to be pinched to death by Prospero. Prospero essentially orders Caliban away to his Prospero's cell and says, trim it handsomely, meaning behave yourself well, make sure that you remain committed to virtue. But it is important to acknowledge that Caliban too is capable of change. With a sense of real self-disgust and shame, he acknowledges the fact that he was trying to replace a harsh master with even harsher and ridiculous masters in Stefano and Trinculo. Remember, they corrupted him with alcohol and dreamed about taking him back to Europe to be part of a freak show. And Caliban acknowledges the sad fact that it was his desire for revenge that caused him to be entrapped in an absurd fantasy. A fantasy that liberation can come through two such idiots as Stefano and Trinculo. So what is very important about examining the final stages of this extraordinary play is to recognize that Shakespeare is very aware that in power relations, if there is going to be harmony and happiness, both those who possess power and those who don't must be prepared to develop and change. Caliban is fully human because he is capable of changing. He says that he will seek for grace. He will strive to be virtuous and to deserve forgiveness. And by acknowledging the Caliban within himself, Prospero has recognized that he is by no means completely virtuous. How could any human being be such a godlike figure? And that he too must strive to change and learn greater compassion. Shakespeare, of course, is never sentimental. The process of truth and reconciliation, the movement towards confrontation with the truth, and after that confrontation, the movement towards forgiveness, will never be complete. Alonso changes. He recognizes how wrong and evil he has been, and he is delighted by the marriage arranged between Ferdinand and Miranda. Antonio, however, does not respond to Prospero's forgiveness, and Sebastian still insists that Prospero's powers must be demonic, that a devil is working through him. Remember that very early in the text, as Prospero is reminiscing about the wrongs of the past, Miranda delivers a very important line she says, good wombs have borne bad sons. Evil will continue to exist. There will always be evil in the world. The nature-nurture debate, which is central to this play, is a very, very complex one. Some people are capable of change. Others are not. In Shakespeare's plays, Evil is always a matter of choice. Fate, destiny, confronts us with choices that we have to make. Prospero makes the right choice. So does Caliban when he strives for grace. But there are certain people dedicated to evil who are not prepared to make those choices. Transformation will not be complete in our world. It requires wisdom, compassion, and imagination. And not all human beings, alas, possess all those qualities. The development of Prospero is complex and comprehensive. He releases Ariel, his tricksy spirit, completely, which suggests that his imagination is free 
completely free now. And as he prepares to return to Naples for the wedding of Ferdinand and Miranda, and then go back to his dukedom in Milan, he interestingly says that when he is ruling in his restored dukedom, every third thought shall be of his death. A strange line which teases many commentators and viewers. Is he saying that he will be obsessed with the spiritual world after his life has ended? Is he saying he will be morbidly preoccupied with death, despite the happy marriage of his daughter and Ferdinand? No, rather I think he is saying that he will focus on the fact that human existence is brief, is transient, a point that I've already emphasized, and therefore he will make the most of every moment. Many critics, including the great Harold C. Goddard, have emphasized the fact that The Tempest is a profoundly religious Christian play, with its emphasis on the need for empathetic imagination, compassion, and forgiveness, and also its emphasis on the need to retain a degree of innocence. Christ's emphasis on the importance of children and their awareness, their intuitive awareness of the need for goodness and acceptance. All these elements are certainly in The Tempest. Think of the combination of knowledge and innocence within Miranda and think above all of Ariel. However, it is important that as Prospero departs at the end of the play, he doesn't call on God to provide him with the power to return to his dukedom. Interestingly, he calls upon us, the members of the audience, to assist him to do so. And this is a marvelous speech that you must not neglect to know. Prospero in his epilogue says, Now my charms are all o'erthrown, and what strength I have mine own, which is most faint. Now it is true, I must be here confined by you, or sent to Naples. Let me not, since I have my dukedom got, and pardon the deceiver, dwell in this bare island by your spell. But release me from my bands with the help of your good hand. What he is essentially saying to the audience is accept what we have explored in this play. Applaud and assist me to return to Milan. Your imaginative acceptance of the ideas expressed in this text will set me free. And this is profoundly true, is it not? By accepting the ideas expressed in The Tempest, by exploring these ideas ourselves, we allow Shakespeare's vision to be freed. We allow Prospero to return to wise leadership in his restored dukedom. And the final lines of the epilogue are, as you from crimes would pardoned be, let your indulgence set me free. Human beings are released only if they themselves are capable of being released from their evils and their limitations. There is a wonderful section of Alfred Lord Tennyson's great poem, In Memoriam, in which he says that all human beings can move upward, working out the beast, and let the ape and tiger die the ape and tiger within us die. In a sense, the Tempest has explored this struggle. If we wish to move upwards and to be fully human, we have to be prepared to let the ape and tiger within us die. There is a wonderful comment by Albert Schweitzer, who observed once that the more we strive to become superhuman, the more we become inhuman. And the Tempest explores this disturbing truth. If we try to be ubermenschen, we cease to be menschen. And 
Prospera acknowledges the fact that full humanity requires one to face one's faults, one's weaknesses, and then strive to rise above them. This would seem to be an excellent point at which to conclude our discussion of this great play. I do not claim to have covered every possible aspect of it, not at all. It is far too rich a work for that. However, I do hope that I have given you food for thought about this truly remarkable text. Thank you very much.